So, Lord, we just thank you for this night, and and God, we just uh, open up your word, Lord. We know that there's always good things there for us, Lord, that your word is, um, Lord, it's it's you just calling us near to you. And so, Lord, we just are ready, Lord. We want to just have hearts that can hear uh, what you have for us, Lord. And then, Lord, as we just open up your word, we just see how your plans are so good, Lord. They're always for our good, Lord, for um, our blessing, Lord, and for your glory. And so, Lord, we just we just want to know you more. We want to know your heart here. I pray that you would you would bless us in, in Holy Spirit, that you would just be uh, speaking here to us tonight. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're picking up on uh, Isaiah. You know, John was planning on teaching tonight, uh, but as most of you probably heard, his uncle passed away on Monday, uh, Tom's brother. So you can keep especially Tom and Carol and the Eastwood family in prayer, uh, and that would be great. Um, the, the, the funeral was this, this morning. Um, so we are continuing on in Isaiah, picking up in chapter 9. Um, and we've been reading here in Isaiah for a while now, it was like the fifth, sixth week or something we've been here, uh, reading about what God has to say to his people. And just to kind of reorient ourselves, because I think it's always good. I mean, Isaiah is a complicated book. I was talking to my wife about, especially the way he bounces around, how it kind of can be, make your head spin a little bit. Uh, but to reorient ourselves, uh, it's important to remember that uh, Isaiah is a prophet. Um, he's living in the southern kingdom of Judah, and he's been speaking God's worth to both kingdoms of Israel, both the northern kingdom of Israel, which we commonly refer to as Israel, and at this time was referred to as Israel, and the southern kingdom of Israel, which is called Judah. Judah is the, in the south, consists of two tribes. Israel is in the north, consists of the ten remaining tribes. And he's giving, speaking prophetically to both of them. Uh, both kingdoms, they were divided after Solomon's reign, were... Um, you know, they're, they're part of God's people. They're, they consist of Jewish people. They're called to, to uh, obey God's law. And they're both called to holiness, to worship the Lord and to trust in him. And both in their way, at this point in time, had wandered from that calling. The northern kingdom um, was really wicked and rebellious from the outset, uh, from the moment of its establishment after, the, after King Solomon's reign. And it was really established on the premise of the rejection of God's law and really casting off the yoke of what God had had said. Uh, Both casting off the king that God had selected in in the line of David to be king over it, so they got rid of that king, made their own king, and in the rejection of temple worship, specifically the worship in the temple in Jerusalem. That's really what the northern kingdom was all about. They basically said, you know, we're not going to go down to Judah and do as God commanded to clearly, clearly in, in the word, to just worship here in that place in Jerusalem. We're going to set up our own alternative temple in Samaria. And life revolved around, in the northern kingdom revolved around this alternative worship. They said it's just as good to worship God in Samaria, though God's word clearly said it was not. The place where worship for the, for the Lord was supposed to happen was in his city, Jerusalem. So Jerusalem had this rebellious spirit, and that rebellious spirit played out in all aspects of the life there. The northern kingdom was, throughout its history, led by wicked king after wicked king. And the Bible makes that clear. It does not mince any words. Just wickedness in the leadership there. And the people practiced evil. Not only were they worshiping at this false place, but they were sacrificing to false, false idols. There was all kinds of, kind of just demonic stuff happening here. There, and, and a lot of injustice. We, we learn, learn about that, too. The southern kingdom, Judah, wasn't that much better, honestly. Um, they had a mixed bag in terms of kings, a few good kings, a few bad kings, kind of went back and forth, good and bad. Um, and at the time of Isaiah's writing, they were under the rule of this really wicked king. His name was Ahaz. At the time of this, this particular instance, what we're looking at here, he was, was under a couple kings. Ahaz, a wicked king. In, in Ahaz's 16-year reign, he managed to both introduce pagan worship into the very temple of the Lord in Jerusalem to the point where he set up an altar to the Assyrian god and was making sacrifices and burning incense in the temple of the Lord. I mean, pretty, pretty bad thing. He was doing that, and he also made uh, an ultimately very uh, deadly alliance with the king of Assyria, where he basically said, if you protect me, I'll give you gold. And, and ultimately, we see historically that didn't go so well for him as that king would eventually try to come and conquer him. 
after his death, actually. He conquered, conquered the, the, the kingdom of Judah. So we see, you know, both these kingdoms, both of them were kind of like rebellious children. And throughout the book of Isaiah, God is using the prophet to reprove or correct both of them. To say, hey, look, you both got problems and we need to talk about it. He's using the, the, the prophet to speak to each of their individual issues to correct his rebellious kids. And like two children, he takes each aside and he speaks wrong to them. Maybe, maybe I'm reading a little of my own personal experience here, having two boys. Um, but but he, he speaks to them really, really as a father speaking to, to children. And like any good father, he does that and he speaks his word to them so, so that they um, might turn from their ways and learn. Not turn and burn, turn and learn. He wanted them to come back. He wanted them to receive mercy. He wanted them to, to enjoy the blessing of, of obedience. Look, the very name the prophet, of, the, of the prophet Isaiah tells us about what God wants for his kids. The name Isaiah means the Lord is salvation. God wants to pour out his mercy, his love, his salvation on these people. He says, he says that's who I'm sending you. I'm sending this guy. His, his name is the Lord of salvation. Guess what he's going to tell you about? He'll tell you about how I want to save you, my kids. Like, I want to bless you. I want to wrap you in my arms. And so he's speaking to these two rebellious th kids throughout his time. God, he desires to save them. And we can see here, you know, he wants to save his kids from himself. So let's look at what the Lord has to say to one of his kids, because tonight we're going to look at chapter 9 and 10, and it's really directed at the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, and the hope that he's laying out for them. So we're in chapter 9, picking up in verse 1. We're just going to go through verse by verse, read them, read them, and, and, and talk about them a little bit as we go along. That's our habit here. 9-1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, and as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. At this point, as, as Isaiah is speaking this message to the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom has actually already been overrun by the Assyrians. The Assyrian king came in, took many people captive, replaced uh, foreigners, and put them in that, in that spot, uh, there in, in that kingdom. They've really been displaced. And the Assyrians, I mean, they were a brutal people. Right? We see, we see he says, he says in, 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 ver, in verse 1, he says, they were lightly esteemed. Right? And that's what, from the perspective of the, north, the, the southern kingdom, they're looking at, at these people up in the northern kingdom and said, man, God must just not care much about you because those Assyrians came in and they whooped you. They really destroyed you. Right? And we could conclude then, looking at, at what happened to them, that you know, God would just be done with them. Okay, they've, they've suffered these consequences. Their nation is really destroyed. They've been carried away. They've been punished by this, this brutal king. We could say, man, well, God just wiped them out. That's just what God does. He's just going to cast them off into darkness. But, but no, interestingly enough, after they've paid the price for their sin, God still has something for them. He speaks still to a future good for these people, a hope for these people who have now been punished. I mean, we know that verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined, is a clear reference to Jesus. And we know that because Matthew 4, 13 through 16 actually tells us that. It explains that Jesus fulfilled these words, and it quotes these exact words in, 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 in Matthew 4, explaining that Jesus fulfilled this this prophecy about a light shining in darkness when he came and began his ministry. And indeed, Jesus spent much of his time teaching and traveling in this northern kingdom, specifically around this region of Galilee on the border between Zebulun and Naph Naphtali. Those are tribes, and, and they're their tribal areas on the, on, the, on the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus began his ministry there. And he was a light to those people there when he came, 700 years after these words were spoken. Um, his message was one of repentance and preparation for the coming kingdom. Matthew 4, 23 and 24 says this. It says, Jesus went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And then his fame spread throughout all of Syria 
And then it also says up into past the Jordan River. Really, it just spread all around this northern part of, of Israel, past Israel, even outside of the, this northern kingdom. Jesus was a light to these people. I mean, he went all around this broken, battered place with these washed up and beaten down people. I mean, you think about what was going on in Galilee. Galilee was the backwoods of an already oppressed nation. Galilee was, was just kind of just this, 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 it was just the podunk part of the northern kingdom, which was already the lesser part of Israel, because obviously the southern kingdom where Jerusalem is is, is, is the best place. And even in Jesus' time, it was the place where the religious leaders lived. But this northern kingdom, I mean, it was, it was right on the border. It was, there was mixing in with lots of Gentiles, lots of, lots of pagan worship going on there. It was just not a nice place. And Galilee had been trampled on. Israel had been trampled on at this point by invader after invader, you know, to the point where now they're under the Roman heel, and Jesus comes in to this backwoods place to a people still reeling from the wounds of war and defeat. And Jesus proclaims to these people the coming of a new kingdom, kingdom of heaven. He comes in really into a very dark, a very bleak situation. And the fact of who Jesus was where he came and how brilliantly he shined in that place, it was a clear fulfillment to these people of these words. To the point where, as, as it says in verse 24, the, the word traveled out throughout all of Syria. In, in verse 24, oh, sorry, of Matthew 4, 24. I don't want to confuse you there. <clears throat> it, it traveled back to Syria, you know, back to the remaining kind of people of this declined kingdom of Assyria that once was about to just conquer them, right? And, 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 so, and so these words were, were just, just famous. This Jesus became famous because he was the fulfillment. He was such a bright and, and perfect fulfillment uh, of this prophecy. He himself was that light. John 8, 12 kind of explains the, the way in which Jesus was light. John 8, 12 says this. He says, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus came to these lost, wandering, and really punished people. And he was a light to them. I mean, he was the, 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 the source that was illuminating God's plan, the gospel to them. I mean, you think about that, like somebody, w w he must have been just shining so brilliantly that, that his name became so famous that he was just clearly this light shining in a dark place. That was the beginning of his ministry. It had an impact. We're back in Isaiah 9. I'm going to keep reading on in, in, in verse 3. You've multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the days of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, let's, let's like kind of look at these imagery. He, he's basically saying when God's kingdom shows up on earth, there's going to be there's this crazy amount of rejoicing. When, when his people lay hold of this gospel, then this, this kingdom comes, it's going to be just a joyous celebration. It's a victorious celebration. Look, verse 3 talks about how there's going to be, it's going to be like the joy of the harvest. You know, you toil and you labor, and then you finally bring any, everything in, and you celebrate. You have rest. You have plenty. I mean, I'm not a farmer, but that makes sense to me. I would think you get to, to, to the harvest, and you finish with that, and you just say, oh, finally, I can rest for you know, a little while at least. It's got to be a joyous moment. In verse 3, he also explains that it's like, a, it's, it's like the joy of plunder. It's like dividing the spoils among, among a group, people of plunder. I mean, that's got to be a joyous thing. I've never, never done any plundering. Never done that. Not, not really my experience. But I'm sure that that's a joyful thing. My, my, my kids watch a pirate show sometimes, so I, I bet they enjoy that. Um, he goes on in verse 4. He says, The rod of oppression is broken. As in the days of Midian, that's a reference to Gideon in the book of Judges, where, where Gideon led the people of Israel to victory over these Midianites who were just oppressive people. It was a huge battle, and it was a joyous time for the, the, as, as, the, as the Lord just showed up and conquered this, this nation that was much mightier than Israel. And he conquered him with just a, just a hundred or so men. Um, I mean, he's, like, he's like likening the coming of Christ to that kind of joy. The battle is over. 
right? He says in verse five, he's like, it's like, it's like the battle is over and we're just walking around the fields burning up the sandals and the bloodstained garments, right? And it's kind of this joyous, joyous occasion. Okay, so, so maybe some of these images don't really resound with 21st century Americans. I, okay, I've never done that. Um, but suffice it to say, it's a celebratory thing when these people come and they realize that Jesus uh, is, is here. When the Lord comes back to set up his kingdom, and what an awesome time of victory that's going to be. And most commentators do feel that these verses are kind of forward-looking. They're referring to the second coming of Christ and the millennial kingdom. Uh, they've yet to be fulfilled. But, you know, for us today, for us today, I think we should remember and, and partake in that kind of victorious celebration. The Christ is one for us. Look, for us who put, his, put our faith in him, for us who love him and trust him, Like, what can come against us? The Bible asks that question in several different ways in several different verses. What can come against those who love the Lord? Like, what pain, what oppression, what burden can rob me of the joy of knowing that Jesus has overcome the world? Like, should we not partake in that kind of joyous celebration too? Us who are are remaining here now in this time. Look, uh, when Jesus come back, is, comes back, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be a time of celebrating, rejoicing. There won't be any tears. There won't be any pain. There won't be any more s- sorrow. There won't be any more politicians. You know, maybe some. Yeah, I thought so. I said, That's a cheap shot. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't. I'm sure there are some nice politicians out there. Um, like, but I sometimes, I get a little concerned with myself, like, that, that, that I'm not, like, resting in the present. Like, I'm not rejoicing in what, God has done for me right now. I'm not just being thankful for today. I'm not like having this celebratory, victorious rejoicing coming out of my spirit today. Like, like, because of, because today, because I look around sometimes at my surroundings and I think, ugh, what's there to rejoice about here? Man, (laughs) C.S. Lewis said that joy is the serious business of heaven. I'm pretty sure that was C.S. Lewis. I actually didn't fact check that, so I hope I'm not wrong. Um, Truly, I mean, God has come to establish and let joy rest in his people. But so often we don't rejoice. So often I don't rejoice. That's a confession. And just speaking personally, like, I don't rejoice, and I find that instead I have the opposite of that. I have anxiety and bitterness and anger. Like, those are things, like, like kind of the opposite of joy that I see sometimes character my, characterize my own life and walk. And, you know, I've, I've noticed something that I find that I feel this lack of joy and I feel the presence of these opposite things when I fail to spend time with the Lord. I'm not talking about going to church exclusively. I mean, look, I spend a lot of time at church. You think you spend a lot of time. I I spend a lot of time here. I'm not talking about that only. I'm talking about spending real time with the Lord in stillness and quiet, just like waiting on him. Just, Just enjoying time of fellowship with him. Just just you and nobody, but you and the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Look, when we do that, will we not know the joy of fellowship, the rejoicing that comes from, from this, this relationship where he has just won us over right now? Because it's a joyful thing. It's a joyful thing to be present with Jesus, to spend time with him. And I get it. There's so many things demanding our attention. And I succumb to that excuse too often But if you lack present joy, do ask yourself, am I spending time with him? Am I just really letting that time just just root me and well up joy within me? It's a good question to ask yourself. Verse 6, back in Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Right? You guys know that from Handel's Messiah. Um, And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, clearly this hasn't happened yet, right? This is one of those yet-to-be-fulfilled prophecy. I don't know about you, but I don't think the government is resting on, squarely on Jesus' shoulders right now. I mean, in the, in the sense that, like, everything is resting on Jesus' shoulders, yes, but in, like, an actual sense in that, I don't know. I mean, we, like, we can write, in God we trust, on all our money or on none of our money, and I think it's, it's kind of a wash. Like, like, we can have prayer in schools or, or not have prayer in schools, and we can put the Ten Commandments in front of state houses or not, and still, presently, Jesus, the government is not resting on Jesus' shoulders, no matter what we do in in that respect. He's referring, rather, to a very literal time, 
a very literal time where Jesus will return and will be bodily ruling the nations. And this is this, this, this after Jesus comes again, prophetically. And all these things that are true of him, his wonder, his greatness, his counsel, the greatness of his wisdom, his might, his everlasting power, his authority, in that day it will be so clear and undeniable that he is those things. And he will rule this world and it, it, with like an ability. This world's going to be awesome. Like all the things we fret about now, not going to have those then. But you know, like that's, and that's to come. But now, even before then, before that kingdom is visible, he is all those things. I mean, he is all those things. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And to those who have prepared themselves for that coming kingdom, where Jesus, that wonderful, mighty prince, where he becomes Lord of their lives, now in this present time, those can enjoy him for all that he is. We can enjoy him as a counselor. We can enjoy him as a mighty father, a wonderful prince of peace. He gives all those things abundantly to his children. Like he has those things for us. If you weren't convinced that you needed to spend time with him before, like think about that now. You got some problems, something weighing on your heart. You know, some difficulty that you think you can't, can't overcome. You know, he's a wonderful counselor. Some, some anxiety that you can't shake. He is the prince of peace. And when we come and we spend time with that Lord, man, there is, there is just joy that comes from that. There is joy that comes with knowing him more and more deeply. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Uh, Jesus will take that seat of throne, the, seat, the throne of David again, He's going to bring justice. He's going to bring Israel back together, order and establish it in all the nations. And it's not the strength of people that will perform that, but it's what? It's the zeal of the Lord of hosts. It's the zeal of the Lord of hosts, as it says here. It's something to think about. You know, who can stand against God's will? And I don't mean that like in like a man, I got so powerful kind of way, but who can stand? What wicked nations, what tyrants, what sinners will slow down the Lord even one bit. Like we can be concerned about the rise of Islam or secularism in this country. Do we think that those things are going to keep God from fulfilling his promises, from showing his mercy, from accomplishing what he has set out to accomplish? It seems to me that sometimes that as Christians, we are a little bit afraid. So we think that God needs to establish his kingdom with conventional methods of politics, armies, e economics, but none of these things are going to be what truly drives God's plan. It's the zeal of the Lord of hosts. It's his will, his timing, his power, his might, working out through, through times. You know, God has chosen to wait for whatever reason. He's chosen to wait for this day when he's going to establish this thing. I don't know why. I don't pretend to know the things. But you know what? I can tell you this. It's not that he's restrained. It's not that he's restrained. It's not that these, these things are so concerning to him, so, so, so out, out, outgunned. That's not the problem. He is waiting. And thank God that he is. <sighs> Look, 2 Peter 3.15 says, The patience of the Lord is salvation. If I had to guess about what he's waiting for, he's waiting that all might come. He's not willing that any should, uh, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of the Lord. He's not restrained. He's patient. He's loving. Verse 8, The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, all oh, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Speaking again to this northern kingdom, the Lord rebukes them for their continued rebelliousness. They've been punished. They've been sacked. They've had their, their, their temple destroyed. And they continue to be rebelled. They're unwilling to repent. 
right? He kind of describes their arrogance and pride. Uh, he says, you know, they kind of just walk around their, their ruined cities and they say, the cities that God destroyed as, as a punishment, as a, as, a, as a chastening. And they say, oh, well, the bricks have fallen down, but we're going to build them back stronger. The cedars are broken, but we're going to come and we're going to bring, bring something even stronger. It's an arrogant pride that will not relent in the face of punishment. And the Lord says here in verse 12, at the end of verse 12, and it's a refrain that we're going to see four times here throughout this, this, this section. His hand, uh, all, of the, all, all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out. Look, until there's repentance, until there's humility, punishment is going to keep coming. That's what the Lord's telling me. He says, look, you're my people. I'm going to discipline you until you learn out of love. Going on in verse 13, we're going to kind of jump. We're going to jump to these different sections here. He describes their pride, their arrogance, their, their rebellion. Verse 13, for the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush. In one day, the elders and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of the people cause them to err, and those who led by them are who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore, the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. And then again, this refrain, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. They continue in their ways, right? They never turn to the Lord. So he's, he's gonna, I'm going to carry away your leaders. I'm going to carry away these lying prophets because you've just all been led astray by them. They've turned you all into hypocrites, liars, right? He says, and until they turn, he says, my hand is still stretched out, stretched out to punish. Goes on in verse 18, for wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars and the thorns and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke through the wrath of of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. Together they shall be against Judah. And again this refrain, for all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Like they won't turn to the Lord. None of them repents. In fact, we see that the, the nation has used this time of uncertainty, this time of punishment, where, where their society is crumbling and they're turning on each other. Right? He's saying, he's saying, you know, one, one is going against another. They're going to devour, devour each other, right? Ephraim's going to go after Manasseh, Manasseh after Ephraim, and then they're all going to go against Judah. I mean, it's a time of total breakdown in society. No repentance. No brokenness. Just a time to take, to rob from one another, to steal, to take things by force, to build up their own little kingdoms. But the Lord's hand is stretched out until there's repentance. He says, I, he says it again, the third time. It's, it's, it's going to be remaining until, until there's repentance. My hand will be stretched out. Verse 10, uh, sorry, chapter 10, verse 1. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice, and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment, and in, de in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. And there's rebellion throughout the entire northern kingdom in every, in every facet of life. Their pride, their arrogance, the corruption of their leaders, their self-obsession. And, and lastly, in this part, just, it's just an injustice, injustice in the land. The perversion of justice by the rich, stealing from the poor. And all these things are disgusting to the Lord. I mean, they're, they're completely contrary to what he's commanded these people to do, to be holy unto him. Right? And, and we get this refrain again, for all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. God is waiting. He's waiting. He says, it's going to remain out there until you break. He's waiting for repentance. Not in a cruel way, in a way where, where he just says, you know, what else is there for you? 
You know, you want to continue on this path, you're going you're gonna, to gonna die, you know. The enemy comes to rob, steal, and kill. And I, I think the father has to understand that's the path they're on. There's got to be repentance. But these people, they, they've been so concerned with their little kingdoms, with their own spheres of power, their own betterment, that they totally disregard the Lord. No respect for him. And, and their failure to repent, I see it ultimately as an, an allegiance problem, a failure to understand whose they were. The northern kingdom, I mean, is falling apart. Supposed to be God's people. people and, and by being God's people, you're also under God's protection. You know, you're, you're, you're taken care of by God, but they cast off the Lord. Out of self-interest, self-preservation, they abandon him. And then when the wheels, wheels really start to come off and their society is, is just, just totally breaking down, they didn't turn back from the Lord. Instead, each one tries to grab whatever they can, whatever wealth, whatever power, whatever security, having abandoned the security of their Lord. Just said, okay, well, we cast him off, and now we really got to fend for ourselves. Instead of going back and just saying, hey, Lord, you know what? We know you're merciful. We know you're forgiving. Instead of going back and claiming citizenship in, the kingdom of, in God's kingdom as God's people who God has told them that they are, they hold on to this crumbling mess of a passing kingdom, something that's just totally fading. It is fading before their very eyes. It's not even like they, it's going to fade eventually. It is broken. They're so deeply allied, so deeply entrenched with that kingdom. They didn't know what to do when it was falling apart. Totally immersed in the things of this world to the point that they forgot, man, God has called me to something higher, something better than this. It's something we're thinking about. Like, like if you today, if your life started breaking down, you lost your job, you lost your health, you lost your good looks. I don't know. I'm not talking about any of you guys. Uh, me, no. Um, if your world was falling apart, where would you run, really? Like what would be your impulse? Really, where would you, where would you turn? Look, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't feel uh, upset when, when we struggle or where, where things, tragic things just happen. I'm not saying that. But I wonder this, and I sometimes wonder this about myself. You ever wonder about your own character? You're just like, what do I really? Who, who am I really? <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of a scary thought sometimes. Um, I wonder how many of us would be surprised at how deeply attached our contentment and our identity and, and, and really the, the things that we, that we love in life is how, how deeply attached that stuff is to the stuff of this world, if it were taken from us. I wonder how many of us would be surprised by, oh, wow, I was really deep and invested into the things of this world if it were, if it were taken from us, and we were there to see it. I, amen. Um, if the, the stuff that the Bible refers to as the pride of life were taken from you, would you still have a reason to go on? Would you still have a reason to live? This is a question, something to think about. Amen. Uh, so much of what we see as important, man, it's just distraction. I'm not saying all of it. But so much of what, 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 we, what we value in life, it's just sinful. I mean, it, it feeds our pride. It feeds our greed. It feeds our self-obsession. Many of the things that we call just like essential in our life, they're just idols. A lot more things than, than we'd care to admit. A lot more things in my life than I'd care to admit. But people who have their allegiance sorted out, you know, who, who understand where they're going, people who have, have invested in the kingdom, and that's not a financial statement, I mean, in just a life way, it, it permeating into every level of your life, people like that become anchored in the Lord, become anchored in eternal things, become anchored in the kingdom of God. They know where they're going to spend eternity, and nothing can shake that. Hebrews 11:16 describes the heart of a person who's ready for the coming kingdom. It says this, they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Do you long for what's coming? Do you long for the place you're going? Or will we leave this world kicking and screaming? Kicking and screaming because I don't know, I I've got nothing to hang on to anymore. Hey, think about that. Look, I'm not saying that we all need to want to die. Uh, I'm, I know heaven's going to be awesome. 
But you know, honestly, and, and maybe this is my immaturity, I'm willing to accept that, I want to see my kids grow up. There's a lot of life that I like. Um, I don't feel bad about that. But surely I am saying this, you know, we should be prepared. We should be prepared to meet our maker one day. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. My life will fall apart one day when I, when I depart from this body, right? Um, I need to be prepared for that. Prepared to be received unashamed by the Lord. Eager to be received into that place that he's prepared for me. You know, I mean, like, like saying, oh, man, I really, I'm ready to go there because I know that I have just, just I, I seek the Lord. That's, that's what I want to be. You know, a person who lives for the coming kingdom is a person who is quick to leave aside the pride of this life when God shows them how vain it really is. Like when God just says, you know what, that thing is just, that's just not for you. And God will do that in his own time. You don't have to go around doing that for God, by the way. God will, God will put that on your own heart. Like, like, like that person is just, is just quick to leave those, those things aside. The northern kingdom, these, these people, they were not. They were hard-hearted. It doesn't mean that we need to be super spiritual or live sinless lives, but it does mean that we need to be interested in keeping a soft heart, a heart that's convictable, a heart that's changeable, that's moldable. You respond to conviction when the Lord send it, sends it because you know like his way is better. You know his kingdom, his intentions, his purpose, his lordship is better than my own. He makes better decisions than I do. That's a person who who's, who's knows where their allegiance lies truly. Like when you're heaven bound and you know that that's, that's, that's ultimately where you are, like that's going to change you. That's going to affect you. You're going you're gonna to invest in the kingdom. I know you guys know that. I don't know it well enough, so maybe I'm just speaking for me. Verse 5, there in 10, uh, 10, 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread uh, them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. For he says, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not uh, my clan like, your, your guess is as good as mine, Karchemesh? <laughs> is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of, of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Like, so the Lord is, is correcting his two kids, right? He's correcting the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, and he's saying, essentially, you know, he's chastening these kids, and he's allowing them to be punished. We have this, this kind of, these words spoken from the perspective of the Assyrians, and the, and the Assyrians basically are, they understand that they're, they're, they're going out, they're going to punish. They don't understand that they're being used by the Lord for this, but the Lord makes it clear there in, in verse um, 5, you know, that that's what he's using them for. He's the rod of his anger, the rod of my anger. He's, this Assyrian kingdom is going to be to them. He's allowing them to be punished. It, it's kind of like he, he, he's letting this bully, this nation, come against his kids just to teach him a lesson. He's saying, he's saying, okay, look, I'm going to allow it. Like, parents, like, do you guys kind of know how that is? You ever let your kids, like, learn a lesson? I've let my kids, like, learn a couple lessons sometimes, you know? You know, I'm not, 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 they don't let them beat, get beat up or anything, but we have a cat, and, you know, I figure if they're going to learn that the cat scratches, they're probably going to let the cat scratch them. <laughs> you know, not, not going to let the cat maul them or anything like that, but sometimes, you know, you just got to let things happen in order to teach a child a lesson. That's what he's doing. He's letting these boys... Get a little bit beat up. It's not, it's not too, too different. He's allowing this to happen. He's letting Assyria play the role, the role of the rod of my anger. Instead of beating him himself, he says, I'm going to let Assyria do this, do this chastening for me. Assyria doesn't know it, but that's how they're being used by the Lord. You'll notice, though, um, that the Assyrians are being superintended by the Lord. And by that, I mean he's, they're being overseen. God doesn't just say, hey, have at it, Assyria. I'm out of here. He says, no, you're, gonna, you're going to chasten my kids. Like, you're not going to know it, but you are going to be the vessel which I use in order to discipline them. But he doesn't walk away from them. He doesn't abandon them. He doesn't just say, yeah, I don't really care about those kids. He watches over very carefully what's going on. 
He's ready to intervene, ready to save once the lesson's been learned. I mean, he's ready. He's ready for that. And we see that as we go on in verse 12 here. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his works on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by my, the strength of my hand, I've done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest of riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I've gathered all the earth up. And there is no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up. Or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among the fat ones. And under his glory, he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and it will consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful fields, both soul and body, and they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. It's what happens to Assyria. God has allowed Assyria to strike out against his kids to teach them, but as a father... He's seeing what Assyria is up to, and he just says, whoa, 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 too much. Your pride and your arrogance have gone way too far. I just love this. You know, like God, um, God is just so unpredictable. All right, he says, he says okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up these Assyrians, unbeknownst to them, to go and, and be the, 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 the means by which I'll discipline my two kids, the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel. But then, you know, and I'm going to teach them a lesson. He says, but now after I teach them a lesson, you know what? I'm going to go teach these Assyrians a lesson, right? He just, he just flips it on him. He says, you know what? Yeah, you thank, thank you for doing that. Thank you for teaching a lesson. By the way, are you ready for your lesson? It's crazy. God is just, God is just awesome. Like, he just does, does what he wants. Um, and, and God really kind of messes with our, uh, like, theology of nations sometimes. Uh, like, we could try to argue, like, God has switched sides. But, I mean, God, God, God just, like, God doesn't take sides. You know, God's on, on his own side. Isn't that interesting? God's like, oh, I, I, I'm for Israel. I'm for Assyria. God is on the side of the humble. God is on the side of the repentant. God is on the side of the broken, whomever they are. He says, like, I, I, I need everybody to know this. I, need, I want all to come to repentance. So, so my children are rebellious. I'll humble them. Assyria is rebellious. I'm going to humble them. God just doesn't, God doesn't care whose side he's on. He's on his own side. I think that's fascinating. I think that's fascinating. We try to put God on our team. God doesn't wear jerseys, though. God is not interested in advancing a particular culture. God is for those who love him, who revere him, who desire to see his kingdom come, regardless of race, class, upbringing, language. He doesn't join teams. He is the team. We join him. He's the captain. Isaiah 66, 2 says, on this one will I look. So you want to know who, who God has mercy on, who, who God will regard, who he loves, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. No geography there, no background there, just a hard attitude. You come to me in humility, you come to me in brokenness, you come to me believing my word, those are your qualifications. All who come to the Lord in need of salvation, they can have it in Christ Jesus. I know you know that. I mean, but how should that knowledge drive us? I mean, shouldn't that drive us to uncomfortable places? The fact that there is no prerequisite to entering into a relationship with the Lord should drive us to be like missionaries. I don't necessarily mean like missionaries abroad. I'm not saying we all need to just move. But ones that have that missionary mindset even at home. I mean, shouldn't we be reaching out past our friend group, past our cultural barriers, past our comfort zones, past our holy huddles, just, just because God is so uh, magnanimous. I mean, God is just so uh, just interested in, in, in spreading his love to any who would repent. 
shouldn't that drive us past the barriers that we put up? If he's willing to remove all barriers except just a willingness to come to him, how willing should we be to go? Look, the power, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believes. All who believes. Look, New Englanders were creatures of habit, right? I, wasn't, I was born in Oregon. Sorry, I'm not a true New Englander. I, I, all right, I'll leave. You don't want to listen to me. No, New Englanders, I've lived here a long time. I've lived here a long time. Uh, we stay in our towns. Like, I know some New Englanders who don't leave their town. Like, these are not big towns people, but some people just don't leave their town. You know those people. You've heard of them. You've heard whispers of them. <laughs> um, they're, like the, they're like Yeti. Um, People, like, we, we, we stay close to each other. I mean, we largely stay within the same race, within the same class. I, mean, I don't think that's a, a racism thing. I just, that's, that's who we are. I don't know why. It's just the way we are. We're weird. Uh, but since the gospel is so universal, shouldn't that draw us out? Since, since God has just leveled the playing field to the point where he just calls anyone, anyone who would come to repentance, should that not draw us out? Shouldn't that create individuals in the church who, who would just step up to invite, to share, to build connections past what's, what's comfortable to us, to minister to outside of our comfort zone? But God doesn't worship our comfort zones. We worship our comfort zones. We're called to worship the Lord, though. And I don't, maybe that's too harsh. I kind of wrote that down. I thought, eh, maybe that's a little harsh. If it's too harsh, just act like I didn't say it. I, I'll apologize later. Oh, you know. Uh, look, we can pray and pray that the Lord would send revival all day. And, and, I, and I hope that's my alarm telling me I should wrap up. Uh, we should pray and pray that, that the Holy Spirit would send revival all day. And I hope that we are praying that. But until we're ready to pray sincerely and in truth, Lord, send me. Like, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to be the person who, who, who is who's your mouthpiece. I'm willing to go out of my comfort zone. Until we do that, like, we stand in the way. We stand in the way. I don't see another way forward for revival in New England except that the church would be mobilized to bring the gospel to all people. We've deliberately isolated ourselves up here. We have. I mean, it's just, it's just the way we are. It's just culture stuff, you know. It's common, I think, in cold places. Um, but you know what? God is breaking down those barriers and drawing people to himself. And if you aren't praying for revival, please do. You know, God, God, God loves this land. I, I do believe that. I, oh, never mind. No, no, it's, it's okay, Tom. It's okay. Uh, it, it's just going to, we just got to pray for that. Uh, let's keep going here. We're going to read our last little, little bit here. Verse 20. It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel... And such as have escaped the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. And the remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, the mighty one of God. For, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O oh, my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in a manner of Egypt. Yet for a very little while and the indignation will cease, as will my anger and the, in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up and scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And his rod was on the sea, so as his rod was on the sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day that the burden will be taken away from your shoulder and the yoke from your, ye from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. He has come to Aath, he has passed Migron, at Michmash he will be attended to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge, they have taken up lodging at Geba. Rama is afraid, Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish, O poor Anathoth. Mad Madmena has fled, the inhabitants of Gibim seek refuge, and as yet he will remain at Nod 
not that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion to the hill of Jerusalem, and behold, the Lord of hosts will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. He's describing here what's going to happen to the Assyrian Empire as they, as they draw near to the city. In verses 28 through uh, 31, it's describing these cities that are, that are coming from the north, starting with the northern cities, leading all the way up to the point where, as he says in verse uh, 32, he says, you'll shake your fists at the daughter of Zion in the hills of Jerusalem. He's saying, he's saying this Assyrian kingdom is going to come all the way down, passing through all these different cities that I butchered, right, in my pronunciation. But he's, he's going to say, we're going we're to pass through these. He's like, and they're going to come all the way up to the hills of Jerusalem, and they're going to shake their fists at you. He's like, and then at that moment, behold, the Lord of hosts will lop off the bow with terror. See, this is what's going to happen. He says, God's going to come and he's going to defend you. He's going he's to protect you. God is going to break the powers of his enemies. Why? Why? Yeah, I mean, God, to protect, to protect Israel. But I think there's something interesting here that I'd like to just, just leave us with. To draw, I believe that he also is doing this to draw even these people to him to chasten even these prideful Assyrians. And there's some, some background here. So look, remember when we were looking at verse 9 right in the beginning? In chapter 9 and verse 2, right in the beginning. And we heard about how Jesus has come as a light to the northern kingdom, the people who were in darkness. And, and then we, we talked about how Matthew 4 identified, talked about that prophecy, talked really specifically about how that was fulfilled when Jesus came to... to, to um, Jesus came up, up and started his ministry in, Ga- in Galilee. And remember in verse Matthew 4, 24, it said this, his fame went throughout all of Syria. And it goes on and talks about how it went past the Jordan, east into the, to, to the river, east of the Jordan River. Why would, as Jesus is ministering in Galilee, and he shows up and he fulfills this prophecy as a light in the darkness to those people in Galilee, why would his fame spread way across the world into Syria, passed into Jordan? Why would they care what's going on over there in Galilee? Who was Jesus to those people? Why would they have cared? He's just some, some Jewish guy hanging out by a lake, talking to some people who've been conquered. You know what, those people in Syria and to the east of the Jordan, those are the remnant ancestors of the broken Assyrian Empire. Those people were Assyrians, I mean, historically, and they had been moved all over the place, but they would certainly have been aware of their history and what had gone on in those regions. They knew that God had toppled them because of the pride of their ancestors, and surely they would have studied Isaiah's word. Look, look, if you were a superpower... And some little puny guy in some city that's, that's nowhere, out in the, the middle of nowhere, said, you're, gonna, you're all going to be destroyed in a very short time. You'd probably laugh about it, right? And then you'd go, say, you know what, let's go kill that guy. And you'd go up to the city where that guy is, and you say, we're just going to destroy him. And then what happens? You just get destroyed, and from that point on, your superpower becomes nothing. You'd probably go back and you say, maybe that Isaiah... Maybe he knew something, right? Surely, I think that these, this broken Assyrian empire, these people would have studied Isaiah's word. They would have gone back and said, what did we miss? I mean, clearly, something was special in, in the word of God here. And so, when Jesus comes as a light to these people in Galilee, fulfilling that prophecy, the remains of that once mighty empire, they're there they're paying a lot, of ten, a lot of attention. They're saying something is happening. We, we remember this Isaiah. He predicted our downfall so un, unpredictably. And now there's this guy coming in Galilee, and he is spreading light. He is a light in a dark place. Something special is going on there. Those down and out, the broken Assyrians, they were just, just sitting around. They were probably wallowing, still still feeling the pain of having been conquered, having been just, just, just broken. And Jesus shows up and there's a buzz. These broken, lost people, people who were at the end of their rope without any hope, are now on the edge of their seats, 
waiting to see what's God going to do here. He's about to do something crazy. And so the word spreads all throughout Syria and all east of the Jerusalem River that this light has broken through. Something amazing happened. God made it so. He broke them to get their attention, to get them ready to receive Jesus Christ. You think about that. 700 years early, he said, I'm going to break your empire. He's setting it up, setting up the whole world so that at the time of Jesus, they're going to be longing for this Savior. They're going to be longing for this light. They're going to be longing for it, longing for salvation. Look, if God did that back then, how much more is our world today longing to hear and receive him? Like, I, believe, I believe that there's like so much turmoil in the world. People are grasping at anything. People are lost and broken. I, I, I can't help but see that when I look out there right now. And they don't want some cultural formation of who Jesus is. Nobody needs the American Jesus with respect to, to, to this nation. It's not a political or moral revolution that people need. The world doesn't need democracy or capitalism, good things, but things that the Christian world tends to export. People are longing for Jesus. They're longing for Jesus Christ. The Jesus who, as Philippians 2 describes him, though he was God, he did not think equality with God is something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. They want the real Jesus. Jesus came as a servant to wash people's sins to save them, to be a light into dark places. And God made the world ready to receive him. And I believe he's doing it again. I, I, I believe that God wants that. And I believe that God has called his church to, 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 to spread that word. I heard a, a good quote recently. I don't, I don't know who it was by. This is that the church is... Yeah, God, God's invisible kingdom is made visible through the church. You know, the church is the mechanism by which Jesus is going to go to all the nations and serve. I mean, he came, he died, and he left the church in his place. He says, you go, you go proclaim my name. You go preach my gospel. Go reach the lost. The church has a message, and we must go. I mean, we're called to go. God, God has set it up. I mean, can you imagine if... Well, I'll just leave it there. You know what, guys? You guys got to go. Uh, anyways, I got to go. You got to go. We all got to go. We've got, we got things to do, truly. I think we do. I think the church has things to do. So let's pray. Lord, uh, God, everything revolves around you and what you're doing, Lord. You uh, desire repentance, humility, brokenness, Lord, that people would come and be just just washed clean, Lord. Receive gifts from you, Lord, your grace, your mercy. And God, you've called us to be um, the mouthpiece that would proclaim that. And Lord, I pray for an empowering of your Holy Spirit for us, Lord, that we would just see past the barriers, Lord, and understand, Lord, that you didn't put them there. God, you've called us to be people who break down the wall of separation, as you say in uh, Ephesians 2, Lord. Lord Christ, you, you go beyond people, beyond race, Lord. You, you just reach out, Lord. You're, you're, you're pouring out mercy. Lord, make us people who are passionate about that, Lord. Just, just let us be invested in your kingdom, I pray. I pray that for, all, for all myself, but especially for my friends here uh, as, as well. Lord, I need that just as much. Uh, Lord, we all need that. So God, just uh, do your will in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.